Welcome to the Bible Made Clear. So we have been going through this series on Calvinism, asking the question, um, really how orthodox Calvinism is. And um, uh, we've been in an addendum here and have been going through the distortions of the gospel of grace today. In other words, the actual effects uh, on the gospel uh, because of Calvinism. And um, so as we're walking through each item, uh, trying to just kind of lay it out and explain it as simply as I can, um, frankly, this is not um, a real fun uh, presentation, but uh, certainly necessary because of the implications. Now, one of the things Calvinism does is it teaches that unbelievers are equal to people that are physically dead. So this is a common thing. Um, some of the older Calvinists, as well as the, the new and neo-Calvinists, uh, they do the same thing. They say that um, uh, the reason that um, people can't respond to the gospel um, and they need to be regenerated, in other words, they need to be born again, have, have spiritual life, is because they're like a dead person in a coffin. You can go up, you can talk to them, touch them, prod them, yell at them, do whatever. They are unresponsive because they're dead. They're not even there, okay? Um, so what they do is they make a correlation, an exact correlation between spiritual death and physical death. However, death is separation. Physical death is a person, uh, their soul and spirit, effectively their consciousness, who they are, is separated from their body, uh, which means that they're not even there. Um, th their body may be there, but the person themselves is not there. Um, however, spiritual death is something different. That is separation um, of a person from God because of their sin. Now, um, the reason that these are not equal is because if somebody is physically dead, the person is not actually in the body. If somebody is spiritually dead, they are in their body and they are present there. And the question is uh, whether um, the image of God as, as a, an image bearer of God, as God created human beings, um, is that image um, entirely erased? In other words, is it, is it just, um, you know, corrupted to a point, but able to function, or is it unable at all to function? Now, a Calvinist would basically say it is. Uh, they would say it's entirely destroyed, which the T in total depravity would tell us that um, it's really total inability. Man has no ability to respond to anything. In other words, they can't respond to... The gospel, they can't respond to um, the word of God being taught. They can't respond to um, the general uh, revelation of God in nature. They can't respond to anything that God, the Holy Spirit, is trying to convict them of on, on their conscience. They can't respond to any of that. In other words, they can't really even respond to God. The Holy Spirit's God, and he's convicting them. However... Uh, they need to be given life so that they can exercise faith. Uh, there's a problem with that, which we'll eventually get into, because if you have life, which means you're born again, why are you, have, why are you exercising faith? You're already born again. But that's just one of the many internal conflicts uh, with the system of Calvinism. But anyways, they teach that unbelievers are... Um, their spiritual death is equal to a physically dead body. Uh, this, however, is not the case. The physically dead and spiritually dead in Scripture are both addressed, and the comparison of one to the other is simply not an equal comparison because you have uh, physically dead and spiritually dead people in the Bible, okay? And they're not the same. A physically dead person is unresponsive to all and spiritually dead a spiritually dead person can be responsive to God and others. So uh, we see this throughout the Bible, that people do respond to God. They do respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction, the gospel, and everything else. Uh, spiritual death is separation from God because of sin. The unsaved person is not as bad as they can be. 
sometimes the save behave, behave worse. So uh, oftentimes we will look at Calvinist view of human depravity and they talk as though people are as bad as they can possibly be and that's just not the case. Uh, it doesn't bear out in scripture. You know, Jesus said, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Uh, they're obviously not being as bad as they can be, possibly. And um, uh, so, and we see Christians that are performing at times worse than unbelievers. So, um, like I just quoted, Matthew 7, 11, Jesus says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father Will your Father who is in heaven uh, give, give good gifts to those who ask him? A little tongue-tied there. And then Paul says uh, to the Corinthians, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Now, uh, in Paul's day, you you need to realize that there was no um, there was no Christian influenced government. There was no Christian environment uh, that was already established in cities. Uh, in other words, the gospel had just been introduced. It was new, and so um, the Gentiles they lived like uh, you know, dirty pagans do. I mean, they worshiped idols. They performed a lot of the rituals associated with paganism, which is, uh, typically very, very immoral. And, um, but Paul is saying, you guys are acting worse than the unbelieving Gentiles. Um, it's quite a, uh, condemnation on them. So, um, obviously, their view and their comparison of, you know, physical death and spiritual death is wrong. It's, it's not, it's apples and oranges. As we go on, Calvinist view of faith as a gift distorts the gospel presentation. Now, the reason that I mentioned the, the spiritual death, physical death is because that affects their preaching of the gospel. In other words, they won't preach to people that are physically, um, in their minds, like a physical dead person that are spiritually dead. If a person's not born again, well, what good is the gospel presentation until God regenerates them? In other words, gives them life, makes them be born again. <clears throat> they can't exercise faith, but it, it's kind of moot at that point. You don't need faith. Um, so anyways, their view of faith as a gift, um, it distorts the gospel's uh, presentation because it assumes that the gospel is entirely ineffective until the person is given life through regeneration and then secondly they're given the gift of faith so then the, after they have this life now they exercise their faith in Christ and it's a gift it's not something they do because if it was something they do or they could do um, as God convicted them and worked in their hearts and, you know, used their conscience and the image of God and everything else. As, as we see that working in Scripture, Calvinists have kind of stripped that out of Scripture and said, no, none of that actually works the way it, it's written. Um, but God needs to regenerate, give the gift of faith. Then you'll see a response from people. Uh, so this affects how and why they preach the gospel where they do and why they won't in certain venues. Uh, John MacArthur has a view of the gospel that distorts what people need to hear or to do in order to be saved. Uh, in a sermon, you can see the link there. Uh, he makes these comments, right? Uh, faith is a gift from God. It is permanent. In other words, it, once you have it, it's irresistible. You're, you're you have it. The faith that God gives begets obedience. In other words, that is the, from a Calvinist perspective, uh, sanctification uh, is always an upward road. Um, it, it continues because the same way that a person irresistibly cannot fight and must respond to 
the gospel to be saved. In other words, the grace of God, work through regeneration, the gift of faith and all that. Now that the person has that, then God continually matures them uh, at a steady rate so that they can show good works and prove that they are the elect. So this is what MacArthur means by uh, the faith that God gives begets obedience. In other words, it never goes the other way. It doesn't fail. Uh, it is the nature of saving faith that when God gives that faith, he sustains that faith. In other words, it continues to grow. And if there comes a point in time when a person ceases to believe the faith was never the faith that God gives. Uh, God gave it to you and he sustains it. I'm not preaching this message and series of messages to you in order to reach some audience beyond this church. He's speaking to his own church, but to point up to you the seriousness with which you must discern your own spiritual condition. Now, I just need to stop here for a second because how, if they're not saved, how can they discern their own spiritual condition? They can't hear. They're dead as rocks sitting in the, they're like a brick in the seat. They're not there. See, this is the problem with Calvinism. Uh, apparently, MacArthur just doesn't really get this. Uh, he says, may God grant you a true saving faith. Now, how can God grant them a saving faith if they don't have it, they can't hear anything yet. This is the mystery of Calvinism. Uh, may God grant you a true saving faith, a permanent gift that begins in humility and brokenness over sin and ends up in obedience unto righteousness. That's true faith. And it's a gift that only God can give. And if you desire it, what is he saying here? If you desire it, pray and ask that he would grant it to you. Is that the gospel? Let's pray and ask that God would grant us the gift of faith so that we can get saved. I mean, um, this is as convoluted. Um, it, 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 he is in such um, conflict with his own theology as well as biblical theology it's a wonder that people can hear what he's actually saying and stay in the audience and not walk out. If a person is not saved, according to Calvinism, they have no desire for God. They're dead. They're bricks. They're rocks. They can't respond. So how can they desire it? And how can they pray and ask that God would give them the gift of faith if they're not saved? They can't. This is the problem. They, they have to, if, if they were regenerated as they sit there, God just gives them life, and then he gives them the gift of faith. What are they asking for? In other words, MacArthur is trying to play in more than one camp, and because he tries to hold the Calvinist line to stay with the Calvinist faithful and all that, um, he obviously has read the Bible at points, so he realizes certain things must be biblical. So uh, this is what puts him in conflict with Calvinism. It puts him in conflict with the Bible because, you know, he's like a guy standing there. The boat's moving away from the dock. He's got one foot on the, the dock and the other on the boat. You can't have it both ways. You either get to get in the boat or stay on the dock because they're drifting apart. They're not the same place. And this is the problem. This is entirely conflicting. Um, this is a contradiction in a message. It's unbiblical, according to Calvinism. Now, look, if you want to tell somebody, you know, if you want God, you desire, um, you don't feel like you have the faith to believe, fine, ask God for the faith to believe or whatever. That, that's fine outside of Calvinism because people have a free will. People are made in the image of God, and they can respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they can respond to the Word of God. Um, they can respond in what God is working in their conscience. Uh, they understand God exists by um, general revelation and creation. So you have a lot of these things working on an unsaved person, but not in Calvinism. They're just bricks. They're bricks in the, in the seat. Uh, until God, you know, miraculously gives them life, gives them faith, and then all of a sudden they awaken. And now that they're awake, what? Why would they ask for something that they then have? See, this is this is the stuff that 
Um, it doesn't make any sense. It confuses people. I would venture to say the majority of Calvinists do not even understand what Calvinism is. And look, there have been well-educated people that are Calvinists that figure it out later on down the line what Calvinism is because <clears throat> people have a tendency to just think, well, um, oh, I believe in eternal security, so okay, I'll be a Calvinist because I don't want to be an Arminianist. Well, th those aren't the only choices. Um, you know, that's a, that's a classic fallacy of false dilemma. You get one choice or the other. Because the way that MacArthur and other Calvinists talk, if, you, um, if you're not a Calvinist, you're either a Pelagian or semi-Pelagian. You know, uh, you're an Arminian. You know, you're either thinking you're working for your salvation or you are working for your salvation or think you get some free will that you don't really have and you're all confused. Um, anyways, l let's move on. I think you get the point here. It's just a little frustrating, quite frankly, because it does affect the gospel. Questions based on the previous quote from John MacArthur. Number one, where in the Bible has the gospel been presented by instructing people to ask for the gift of faith to make sure that they are saved? Answer, nowhere. Now, we look at the Gospels. We see what Jesus taught and modeled. Um, we watch what he did. Uh, we listen to his teachings. And then in the epistles, we have very specific New Testament instruction that occurs after the church is born. So the Gospels have much in it that anticipates it. So basically, if you see something taught in the Gospels, practiced in the book of Acts, taught in the epistles, well, that's biblical because it keeps that same line of theological teaching through the, the entire New Testament. You don't see any of this. This is not, you know, um, I, you know I've seen MacArthur make fun of Calvin, um, uh, charismatic churches um, which, again, some of them do deserve criticism, but m my point is, you know, he sits there and makes fun of them for some of their practices. Hey, this is an unbiblical practice right here, and this is at the crucial point of preaching the gospel. Very important stuff. Uh, can't be ignored. Number two, uh, question. If faith is a gift and people are dead as rocks or corpses, how can they have faith? It's not, uh, in other words, um, not yet received as a gift. Uh, to even ask for the gift. In other words, they're bricks, right? The answer, they can't, according to Calvinism. MacArthur contradicts his own message. But again, this is common with him. This is something that he does all the time. But he does it so demonstratively that people don't question him uh, because apparently, you know, then you come under his wrath. Um, again, as we move along, another question. MacArthur quotes 2 Corinthians thirteen fifteen. Uh, but how could Paul tell the Corinthians to examine themselves for genuine faith uh, if they did not have genuine faith? In other words, he quotes 2 Corinthians 13, 5, uh, where it says, you know, Paul says, examine yourselves to, to see whether you're in the faith. So he quotes that and then says, hey, you need to, if you desire it, you ask God for, you know, for the faith. Well, the problem is, is that if you don't have faith, if you're not already um, born again, in other words, regenerated, and have the gift of faith, you're not going to desire anything. You are a brick. I don't know how much simpler to say that. Answer, they couldn't, right? How could they ask um, for faith if they didn't have it? They couldn't. They would need the gift of faith to know whether they had the gift of faith. The rest of the unsaved, like MacArthur's church, could not respond to the appeal because they would be dead as rocks or corpses. Calvinism presupposes the gift of faith to have the gift of faith. This is absurd. They presuppose that you need to have what they're telling you you don't have to want what they're telling you you should ask for. I hope I said that right. I think I did. Also, why do unbelievers need to exercise faith in Christ or ask for faith if they are regenerated prior, as Calvinists teach, so they can believe. In other words, if you are already regenerated, you're born again. That's what being born again is. If they are regenerated, born again, 
they are saved. Why do they have to get saved after they are saved? These are the contradiction and unbiblical teachings of Calvinism. It's really unbelievable. All right. The other problem with the gospel is lordship salvation. It is a false gospel that mixes works with faith. In MacArthur's book, The Gospel According to Jesus, um, he says, I certainly do not advocate a works salvation. Now, <clears throat> I actually had the book on my desk here. I must have put it back on the shelf. Um, so he says that in his book. Um, however, and that's at the beginning, um, you know, page uh, Roman numeral 14. However, throughout the book, he wants to include aspects of, Christ, of the Christian life that are within the process of sanctification into the act of justification. In other words, he is pulling back into the justification process, sanctification aspects. What MacArthur states in the beginning is nullified by the subsequent statements throughout his book. So it doesn't matter. He can say that at the beginning, but the rest of the book teaches you something different. Ironically, MacArthur criticizes dispensationalists, which he is himself, and blames them for the gospel presentation that he presents as bad news and easy. So he criticizes, um, you know, easy believism. Oh, you just have to believe. You don't have to, you know, really kind of, you know, believe like a real believer and and kind of prove it out and, you know, have this level of understanding and and all these other added extras uh, that apparently that satisfy him. Um, so if it's not that, then it's just easy believe in ism or bad news. However, this is a red herring and is a way to neutralize some dispensational writers while at the same time advocate their views uh, associate their views to gospel preaching. He criticizes, he broad brushes and mischaracterizes constantly. So in other words, w what he is doing in the book is he criticizes dispensationalists because he says, yeah, this whole dispensationalism thing separates things out so that the gospel is made too easy to believe. And if it's too easy to believe, then it's not the real gospel because you can't really you know, really front loaded up with all these requirements. Um, and so you get all these people that thinking that they believe, but they don't really believe because it just doesn't have enough of a punch in it. And, and this is because of the dispensationalist, which he actually is a dispensationalist. I've actually never heard him say anything positive about dispensationalism. I don't know why he is a dispensationalist, but we'll get into that. So the following quotes from MacArthur's book, The Gospel According to Jesus, reveal his bias against a simple presentation of the gospel of grace to a gospel that requires more than faith alone. And this is very dangerous, very dangerous. The following quotes are from The Gospel According to Jesus by John MacArthur, right? All right, so I give you the page number after each one. Those who, and this is from the 1989 version, those who teach that obedience and submission are extraneous to the saving faith are forced to make a firm but unbiblical distinction between salvation and discipleship. So what he's going to do is he combines salvation and discipleship into the justification process, into the, the response of the gospel. Uh, this dichotomy, these two that he is going to combine together, like that of the carnal spiritual Christian, sets up two classes of Christians, believers only and true disciples. This is what he says on page 30. Now, in response, the Bible makes a distinction between believing, which is justification, the moment in time, and discipleship, which is really sanctification. These are choices that we make in sanctification. The conditions of discipleship Jesus required is more than believing the gospel. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That, that's not the gospel. The gospel is believing 
that Jesus died on the cross as your substitute so that you can be forgiven uh, in simple terms uh, and that he raised again for our justification. Um, if you're preaching the gospel and saying, unless you hate your father and mother, you know, you start adding these discipleship qualifications. He, he's talking, Jesus is talking here to people that are believers. There are, they are following him. He's talking about discipleship. Uh, this is not a call to salvation by grace through faith. This is a call to discipleship where the decision for a more yielded life is offered to those who already believe. MacArthur and other lordship salvation proponents conflate, they merge the gospel with discipleship, which is an error. It is a heresy. It is not the Bible. It is unbiblical. It is unorthodox. It is a heresy. Continued response. In MacArthur's attempt to prevent people from responding to what he calls an, e uh, an easy gospel or easy believism, he has overstated the justification process by making demands on people that the New Testament does not. Do people come to Christ by faith in the Savior uh, of their sins for justification as Paul uses Abraham as an example, question mark, right? Uh, Genesis 15, 6, uh, Abram believed in the Lord and God accounted his faith for righteousness, it says. Or do people need to come to Christ with additional requirements that are more related to sanctification and maturity? MacArthur conflates the two, justification and sanctification, and wants to avoid anyone possibly slipping into salvation without this, uh, his requirements being met. He doesn't want any kind of quasi-believers or if you're not fully serious. I mean, he's looking for like the Navy SEAL of believers. Otherwise, you know, just the rank and file, you know, kind of military person. He isn't interested in that. I mean, you know, you, you got to enter in as a special forces like believer. Uh, otherwise, you know, forget it. He goes on to say, the call to Calvary must be recognized for what it is, a call to discipleship under the lordship of Jesus Christ. To respond to that call is to become a believer. Anything less is simply unbelief. Who is John MacArthur? He's not God. My gosh. The, I mean, if the Bible said that, it would be one thing, but he's just, he's just mixing terms. The added condition for salvation is, uh, are to adjust the gospel to the Calvinistic view of election and sanctification, both being irresistible works of God distorting their gospel. So this is just an attempt to take the gospel, squeeze it into the Calvinistic framework so that, you know, you have this idealistic, non-real person that comes to faith, has all the enlightenment that they need. I'm committed. Yes, Jesus is Lord. I know what that means. I'm bowing. I'm following. I'm committing. You know, I'm, I'm hating everybody but Jesus. And I mean, it's this long list of requirements um, because it's irresistible. And then the sanctification process, which is also irresist irresistible within Calvinism, because if you irresistibly get saved you will irresistibly be sanctified and then you will eventually because you prove yourself elected by performing all the good works throughout your life without any failures you'll endure to the end and then you when you stand before God you realize hey I was one of the elect but not till then just at that point continued response MacArthur's view that we lose our sin nature when we come to Christ, also plays into his theology of requirements. In other words, this also affects how he preaches this. He does not recognize the possibility of carnal Christians, though Paul does. That's a little interesting. Paul recognizes carnal Christians, but apparently John MacArthur, uh, he did, he's at, um, in disagreement with Paul. People without sin natures do not sin. Uh, Jesus did not have a sin nature. Jesus did not sin. If when you got saved, you think you lost your sin nature, then you are delusional because everybody has their sin nature until glory. And in the glorification, right, when we get our new bodies, then you will be separated from your sin nature because Jesus, Romans goes through this so clearly. Jesus 
when in paying for our sins on the cross, he justified us. He paid the past for us, the penalty for our sin. Okay. Um, so we are in the past. Um, our sin was paid for. So the penalty is gone. I'm not going to go to hell and pay for my own sin. He already paid for it. In the present, the sanctification process, where the past at the cross separates us from the penalty of our sin, which is hell, in the present, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives separates me from the power of sin. Okay? But though my sin nature is disengaged, it's still there. That's Romans 6. In the future, when we have glorified bodies, then we're separated from the presence of sin. We don't have a sin nature anymore. Okay, so um, this is th these are the three clear stages in the New Testament. I, I don't know how Calvinists get that or anybody else that you don't have a sin nature after you get saved, but it's part of their confused theology. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. People without sin natures do not sin. Jesus had no sin nature and did not sin. To attempt to elevate a person to this level in this life must reduce the Lord Jesus and is at a minimum a distortion of Scripture and the Bible's view of Jesus Christ. One has to wonder how anyone would be comfortable with this view of man prior to glorification. Calvinists our works focused from the presentation of the gospel itself. And this is part of the problem. Um, because, see, you won't have a sin nature. You'll only do good works, prove your elect, and on and on. He goes on, page 33. He says, salvation by faith does not eliminate works per se. It's a dangerous statement. It does away with works that are the result of human effort alone, Ephesians 2.8, alone. Got to read all his words there. It abolishes any attempt to merit God's favor by our works, verse 9, but does not deter God's foreordained purpose that our walk of faith should be characterized by good works. So this is some, this is, basically linguistic gymnastics this is saying look i'm not saying that you know um you're saved by works however let's not let's not get ahead of ourselves when you come to christ <laughs> that you you better be having some works in your mind there because that's what god's going to do so let's start off by explaining them to you this is this is not i'm just saying this is not the gospel it's not the gospel i read anyways um, doesn't appear in my New Testament. Giving MacArthur the benefit of the doubt on the previous quote, I strongly disagree with his view. However, it answers why he is so comfortable with his view of lordship salvation, doesn't it? Because he is comfortable drawing sanctification into the justification process. That's why. My intent here is not to give a review of MacArthur's book, but to show that the requirements that Calvinism imposes on the teachings of the Bible forces the Calvinist faithful into these unbiblical aspects of presenting a gospel that includes the pressure of good works. Good works are not part of the gospel message. I just don't get this. Um, even in the previous quote, he admits that works are part of our walk of faith, why would he then make it part of the justification process of salvation by faith? doesn't make sense. No one is doubting that the Christian life uh, is a life of faith and presenting ourselves to the Lord for his work to be done in and through our lives. Nobody's doubting. We're not saying that that's not the point. Uh, but that's after you're saved. But adding requirements to the gospel, in other words, front-loading it, especially when that person is dead as a rock or a brick and cannot understand any truth, according to Calvinism, right? Uh, isn't this teaching a corpse in the coffin requirements, trying to, uh, requirements prior to his being <laughs> raised from the dead? It's like having a conversation with a person in the coffin, uh, instructing them everything they need to do 
once they get raised from the dead. But they're not there. See, that's the whole point. Uh, the contradictions in this theology are many, and they are astounding, i got to tell you. The, the following quote from Robert Wilkin, uh, this is a, a journal article out of the Journal of uh, Grace Evangelical Society, right? So the references there. It's a review of John MacArthur's uh, Hard to Believe, the high cost and infinite value of following Jesus. So MacArthur's been kind of singing this tune, playing this banjo string for a long time. So <clears throat> Wilkin has some good quotes here, which is why I added in. He says, I also found a number of places where the author, MacArthur, indicates that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. However, in all of these places, the author is careful to indicate that this faith includes repentance, obedience, and surrender. For example, MacArthur writes, salvation is giving up your life and embracing his. It is taking Christ by faith, acknowledging the reality of who he is and what he did. However, if you notice, even here where he says that salvation is taking Christ by faith, we do not have anything that implies that this is faith alone. Notice that this is preceded by salvation is giving up your life and embracing his. There's another example. I pray that in your grace you would save before it is too late any uh, who have been deceived into thinking they're true believers without any passion for the worship of God and Savior in whom they say they believe. Here, worship is somehow part of believing. Now, um, so what Wilkin does is he quotes MacArthur, you know, I pray that you, um, you know, um, I pray that your grace, uh, in your grace, you would save blah, blah, blah. So MacArthur's writing that in his book. And what he's saying to unsaved people is that, you know, unless they are going to have a passion for the worship of God, and I mean, um, then they're not true believers. But first of all, if they're not believers, they don't understand what he's saying. And if they are true believers, then the measure of their passion is not a condition of their salvation. I just, I don't, this is really, um, it's troubling, quite frankly. And, um, uh, and it's upsetting because, um, you know, Jesus died to make the gospel simple uh, to understand and, and simple to believe. It, it is not a complicated message. Once a person has life, then God does the work in them. OK, uh, as you as you came to Christ by faith. Right. So walk in him, Paul says. Uh, so you came by faith, you walk by faith, all right? But you, you don't start walking before you are, are alive spiritually. You can't w have a walk with God. Um, you know, Jesus compared the, the apostles to fishers of men, right? He says, um, you know, but uh, Jesus doesn't clean the fish before he catches them. You got to catch them first. They got to be caught. They, you know, person believes in the gospel and then, then they, they start getting cleaned up. MacArthur wants to start cleaning them before the fish are even on the line. This is not good. Justification and sanctification are different aspects of our salvation. They are different in the Bible and in our practice. MacArthur gives a different gospel. I'm sorry to say it, but he does. He is not preaching the gospel of the New Testament. A proper presentation of the gospel certainly talks about sin, forgiveness, and a relationship with Jesus Christ the one who is the centerpiece of the saving message of the gospel. Okay, now, what, is, what does it say? Uh, remember what Paul said to the Corinthians when we started uh, presenting the gospel or earlier in the, the video presentation, 1 Corinthians 15. What did he say? He says, by which also, talking about the gospel, you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He didn't say whether you had, you know, what, what's your passion for worship? Um, you know, how committed are you? Uh, you know, uh, and, and like, what's your views on this and that? And, you know, are you, are you really um, fully committed? And understand, do you understand the, the, you know, how much Jesus is Lord of your life? I, I mean, you know, let's give you a test. He's not doing that. He's not doing that at all. 
there is no mention of surrender, obedience to commands, passion for worship, or passion for anything in Paul's describing the gospel and what he preached to the Corinthians to receive. The gospel is about believing, not the maturing process the Bible teaches in regard to sanctification or the discipleship process, which is really the same thing. Because look, sanctification is something that you make a decision. Paul teaches in Romans, present yourselves to God. He wants them to mature. Well, that is the act of discipleship, okay? All disciples are believers, but not all believers are disciples. They should be, but they're not necessarily, okay? Uh, so all disciples are Christians, but not all Christians are disciples. At least this is the distinction the Bible makes no matter what others say, including John MacArthur. He doesn't get a... Uh, he doesn't get a free ride on this, uh, right? Paul used this, and he, meaning Abram, believed in Jehovah, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Paul bases his entire gospel of justification on this verse. For what does the scripture say? <clears throat> Paul tells us, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. It's owed them. Somebody that does work, they owe you. It's not grace. It's not given freely. Um, you know, you've earned it. It's a debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, his faith, not the one that God gives him, the person's faith, is accounted for righteousness. I don't know how much clearer. I mean, look, I didn't make this up. I didn't write the Gospels. Um, this is what Paul wrote, um, and it's what we are to believe. A proper presentation of the Gospel um, going on, right? <clears throat> it must be remembered that salvation is through faith alone without respect to what a person will do after they are saved. If salvation is genuine, the Holy Spirit will work in the person's life to produce the sanctifying work. But this is a voluntary aspect of our walk with God, which is why Paul beseeched the Romans, right? Romans 12, uh, because there is a faith aspect to presenting ourselves to God for maturity and spiritual development, effectively discipleship. Th that's why Paul pleads with his audiences all the time through the letters that he wrote. Um, you know, Look, John MacArthur would like to kind of lock him into all these commitments and rules and everything. That's not the gospel. That's the gospel plus, which makes it a false gospel. It is more than requiring belief. To believe sanctification is automatic and always progressive without deviation, which is Calvinism, is to misread the New Testament. Reading the Corinthian epistles should fix that false ideal. If Paul can warn not to either grieve the Holy Spirit, right, Ephesians 4.30, or quench the Holy Spirit in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it means that believers can do just that. There are choices all believers have, and the New Testament uh, tells and forms of the right ones to make because the power of the Holy Spirit is in a believer's life to do it. Now, look, the, the reality is that people mature at a different rate, and some people their maturing process gets stunted by some, um, you know, reason or another, and then they become carnal. But <clears throat> that doesn't mean they're not a believer. Forcing criteria uh, other than faith upon an unbeliever is misrepresenting the gospel at a minimum and preaching a false gospel in the worst case. None of this is good. All right, moving on, <clears throat> continuing quotes by MacArthur. Uh, this is on uh, page 83 and 84. Recognition of a personal sin is a necessary element in understanding the truth of salvation. One cannot come to Jesus Christ for salvation only on the basis of a psychological, uh, of a psychological needs, anxieties, lack of peace, a sense of hopelessness, an absence of joy or yearning for happiness. Salvation is for people who hate their sin and want to turn away from the things of this life. 
It is for individuals who understand that they have lived in rebellion against a holy God. It is for those who want uh, that should be to turn around uh, to live for God's glory. Salvation is not a mere psychological phenomenon. I grasp what MacArthur means when he says recognition of a personal of personal sin is a necessary element in understanding the truth of salvation. I, I and I realize that um, you know he's on the right track there. However, um, I don't think that you can isolate it down so that you can then determine how and by what reasons people need to come. And if they're oh oh you're coming for this reason, that's not legitimate. Um, you know God gets people to the place uh, of receiving the gospel by many different reasons and that that is that quite frankly isn't even our business that's something god's doing with them however people can be drawn to christ for a number of reasons and we cannot dictate all those reasons this is where he overstates the position of those sharing the gospel and those responding there were people in the Bible that came to Christ for various reasons or needs they had, right? So you got blind Bartimaeus. I mean, he came, um, you know, they, they kept telling him to shut up. Finally, you know, Jesus asked him what he wanted. He wanted his sight. He gave him his sight. And then it says, and then he followed him. Well, he, he came, he didn't come because he recognized himself as a sinner. Now, obviously, within the process um, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what Bartimaeus was thinking, but he came because he was blind. He had a need. When Jesus responded to the need and healed him, now he probably recognized, my goodness, this is the Messiah. Look what he did, right? Whatever. But, but all those are assumptions. Um, and, and the ten lepers, right? Jesus heals the ten. Only one comes back and thanks him. Um, you know, New King James says, uh, you know, the one was made whole. The idea is, is that, um, you know, the nine, you know, Jesus said to him, he says, where's the other nine? Like they weren't, they went, and as they went, they were healed of their leprosy, but only one come back to give thanks. Obviously showing that there was a depth of um, effect in that person's life that was different than the other nine. But they all came just because they were lepers, okay? Um, I just, I think that we, it's a dangerous area when we start to dictate what people actually need to be thinking um, in order just to get them, you know, to come to Jesus. Uh, we don't want to be in the position of telling people they cannot come to Christ because their personal need does not suit our theological presupposition. I mean, you, you're, you're, you find yourself in the place of actually preventing people from coming to Christ that God wants there. Uh, our responsibility is to share the truth of who Jesus is, what he did for them, and allow them to make a decision in relationship to the gospel, the good news offered. It is Jesus' business to do the work in their hearts and lives at conversion. That's not me. I just, look, uh, like G. Campbell Morgan said, we're errand boys. We're just, we're just carrying a message. I didn't create the message. I didn't design it. I didn't do everything that was required to get the message to have any uh, effectual work in a person's life. I didn't do any of that. I benefited from it, and I'm just, you know, I'm handing that message to other people because they need the same Savior. But, you know, starting to get into being kind of a dictator and controlling what people should be thinking, feeling, all stuff, uh, you know, quite frankly, that, you know, uh, that's nonsense, really is. MacArthur, uh, the quote from his book, uh, Faith Works, the Gospel According to the Apostles, um, Let's see. The quote is this. Because we were dead to God, we were dead to truth, righteousness, peace, happiness, and every other good thing. No more capable to respond to God than a cadaver. Now, we've kind of gone through this, but this false view to deadness, as we've discussed in earlier videos or earlier in this video, is a hindrance to the gospel presentation and also forces MacArthur and others to contradict their own theological positions, like we had discussed. If an unbeliever is as dead as MacArthur says, any appeal he would make to them is valueless, right? Uh, Calvinists cannot have it both ways. They cannot hold that people are dead as rocks or cadavers or bricks, and at the same time, 
say they can ask for help from God um, or ask basically for the gift of faith from God or anything from God since they are dead to God. No more capable to respond than a cadaver, right? The red part being MacArthur's quote. As he quoted earlier, may God grant you a true saving faith, a permanent gift that uh, begins in humility and brokenness over sin and ends up in obedience unto righteousness. That's true faith. And it's a gift that only God can give. And if you desire it, pray and ask that he would grant it to you. The question is, how can they desire faith or ask for it? His appeal presupposes that they have the gift of faith already. I, I know I'm repeating myself. These contradictions are not the mark. Uh, I'm sorry. These contradictions are the mark of a false theology because the scriptures do not contradict only false teachings do. And these Calvinistic teachings are all in conflict. They contradict each other. It is easy to see how these Calvinistic views clearly distort the presentation of the gospel. So MacArthur continues, uh, let's see, his quotes and stuff. So the danger here is that obedience in discipleship is a responsibility we have to help converts after they are converted, not before. This backwards method is similar to the Boston Church of Christ cult, of which I am personally familiar. You know, they're here, uh, having worked in Boston for 16 years. So for 16 years, um, I worked in Boston, you know, uh, in the technology business, and uh, so I met a number of these people. Their method of converting people is to explain the gospel to them. So th they're very similar to Calvinists in this. Uh, their method is to explain the gospel to them, then have them prove their devotion and commitment um, to a relationship with Christ for a time before they will baptize him. They teach, the, they teach baptismal regeneration. In other words, they're not saved until they're baptized. Um, that is uh, only a, a legitimate, uh, I'm sorry, they teach baptismal regeneration that is only legitimate if performed by them. This means that after a potential convert um, lives like a Christian, demonstrating their commitment to Christ, in other words, being unsaved during the commitment phase that they send them through, they then baptize them. In other words, they create a perfect Pharisee by making people walk with God without the Holy Spirit and being unconverted, according to their theology, before they will then convert them by baptism. They teach people that it is an external obedience that legitimizes their converts. So what the Boston Church of Christ do is they basically, <clears throat> you know, they get these prospective converts, they get them in and they make them, you know, demonstrate their commitment. They have them, you know, reading the Bible, doing all these other things, you know, their, their involvement and commitment levels. And, you know, they talk about what they need to do. So they do all this stuff. And once they see, hey, you know what, uh, this person's been doing this for a few weeks or month or whatever, and you know, they're sticking with it. So now they can get saved. It's like, what? So now they're living like a Christian, or at least according to them, for these, you know, few weeks or month. And um, so now we're comfortable baptizing you because in the baptismal process that we actually baptize you, that's when you get saved. So think about this. They're living without the Holy Spirit. How are they living the Christian life? It's all external. It's Phariseeism. They're just... And again, this is according to their theology. It's all just um, fulfilling rules and doing stuff that satisfies the Boston Church of Christ elitists, the leaders. Now, you move that same concept over into Calvinism, and that's what you have with Lordship Salvation. In the black here, the, Lordship's, the Lordship concept is similar in that it requires from the unconverted a level of commitment to obedience they could not possibly understand according to Calvinistic theology. Cal Calvinists trying to explain this stuff to people that are unconverted, how is that even possible in their own theology? It doesn't make sense. I don't see why people can't understand this. For the unconverted is still stone dead and cannot possibly know what obedience as a Christian could truly mean 
especially being dead as a rock. If they're just a brick and you're telling them, okay, so if you're going to give your life to Christ now, so you need to do this and you need to do that, they don't know what it means. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They have nobody to teach them. The Holy Spirit's your teacher. You get saved. Uh, do we need teachers? Yeah. I mean, I'm a Bible teacher and I'm teaching the Bible, but <clears throat> it's not going to make any sense to you in reality unless you are a believer and then the Holy Spirit will take his truth that's being taught properly and then he'll apply it to the person's heart and life. Okay, so um, so the Holy Spirit is really the teacher. The person can't learn without the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's see. So um, uh, the last sentence, the conflicts and confusion Calvinism teaches and models seems to be the only consistent aspect of the theology. Everything else is inconsistent. The only thing that's consistent is their inconsistency, I guess. So, and again, I'm sorry, this, the presentation brought up the quote late. So um, MacArthur says, clearly the Bible concept of faith is inseparable from obedience. That, that was what this was responding to, this whole response here. Apologize for the uh, backwards presentation. Uh, I guess that's a good illustration of putting the cart before the horse. The answer was before the, the sentence out of the book, and it's kind of like sanctification before justification. All right. Um, let me see here. Um, <clears throat> all right. So MacArthur's inability to fully support dispensational theology results in a confusing gospel message. <clears throat> and, you know, I wonder, let's, because we're almost at an hour, let's save the, um, the whole dispensational uh, conversation for next time. Um, got a lot to think about here, so um, we will, um, we'll jump into this next week. So, look, <clears throat> I know uh, if you're a Calvinist, please bear with me. I, I know this is difficult. Look, this is frustrating for me because I know it's not the truth. Um, it, it, you know, please don't post a message saying, oh, you just don't understand Calvinism. I'm, I'm quoting, you know, the, the um, more prevalent authors, okay? Um, MacArthur is one of the bigger names and, you know, more vocal about all this stuff uh, than almost anybody. And, uh, you know, I'll get a couple of other uh, folks in there, as you can see, um, you know, I'll, I'll end up getting, uh, Philip Johnson in there and everything else. So, um, look, <clears throat> please pray about it. If you're Calvinist, pray about what, what you have been taught. Go read the Bible. Just, just read the Bible for yourself. Read through, see if, see if taking the Calvinistic framework and laying it over the Bible, see if it works. It's not going to work. You, you, have to, you have to do what Jehovah's Witnesses are taught um, you can, or, or other cultists. You can only read the Bible in accordance with the materials that they give. If you can read the Bible without Calvinism, if you can separate your mind in that way, you know, and just kind of, you know, break it away from uh, the whole tulip concept. And if you can just read the Bible... You would never, you would never come to the tulip concept. You would read the Bible. God would be interacting with sinful people, drawing them. They would obviously be making their own decisions of faith. This is not dishonoring to God. It's how God works, and it's how he created us. You know, um, through all these continual um, mantra sound bites that Calvinists put out about, oh, this is, you know, this is just man's attempt to gain their own glory and gain their own salvation and contribute to the salvation of God and blah, blah, blah. Y you know, um, propaganda, rightly defined, is when you continue to say something about something that you are doing, but you're actually taking that concept and imposing it on somebody else. And it's exactly what Calvinists do. You know, like, for example, even in their phraseology and their identification phrases and everything, 
They call TULIP the doctrines of grace. <laughs> That's not grace. That's not grace. Perseverance of the saints isn't grace, and perseverance of the saints is not eternal security. But it it ostensibly is is explained like that because that's what people want to hear. Calvinists would be the first to jump and say the last thing we want to hear is something that is preached to just make people hear what they want to hear. They would be the people that fought that probably the most. And yet that's actually what they're being given. They're being um, they're being given a a presentation through the tulip process that, first of all, is not only not biblical, but um, perseverance of the saints. It is it is talked about as though it's eternal security. And it's not. It's got nothing to do with eternal security. It's Roman Catholicism that's repackaged by Calvin. Um, but anyways, look, that's the reality of it. We'll talk about it more when when I get to the end of this um video series hopefully i'll only have one or two more videos and then um if like i say if there are other questions i'll um do a video and answer them if people feel as though there are certain things that i did not address that i should have but anyways until next week uh, i'll get off my soapbox here may god truly bless you as you continue to study his word